Today we start a new series called Ready, and we're going to take this through the summer to help us get ready for this new season at Calvary. Uh, as you may know, Pastor Kuhn is uh, transitioning into retirement. Come this uh, officially, it will be October. We're going to have a, a great service for him in September, and uh, so we're excited for that. And I just want to say publicly and in person, thank you for uh, entrusting me to be the next lead pastor here at Calvary. I appreciate that. God is good. God is good. Praise God. We were praying about what to do, and, and, and I, I specifically was praying, and I was talking to our team, and I really felt like uh, we need to get ready. But it's not just ready for, like, September. It's really even ready today. You know, we always need to be ready to serve and to be ready as a church. So I want to I wanna focus on being a ready church, you know, for anything that comes our way, but also to continue to serve God. Our mission statement here is we do all we can so all may know God's love and follow Jesus. And so that mission continues no matter who's uh, lead pastor here. And that's, that's what God wants us to do. And so together, I thought we as a church need to be ready, not just Pastor Ryan, not just Pastor Kuhn, but this is your church too, am I right? And so I believe that we work together to be ready as a church. You're the church body, okay? You are the church body. It's not just this sanctuary, this building, but we are the body, so we're in this together. And uh, I felt very uh, compelled to get us ready, especially for the school year too. Why do I say school year? Well, everyone's done with vacations, and uh, right, hopefully. <laughs> and kids are back in school, which I'm already kind of looking forward to that, which is, no, I love my kids. That is messed up. Uh, yeah. And uh, no, I love them. So, but we're back, we're back in the groove, right? But that does not mean that we're not applying what we teach in this series like tomorrow, right? Or today. I do not mean that. But when I look at a calendar as a youth pastor being here for 11 years, I get hype about September because it's time to reach families. It's time to reach everyone. Uh, when everyone's back in the groove. So we want to get ready for that and for this transition where pastor will be re retiring. So I'm excited about that. Today, our first message has to do with being awake, awake spiritually, awake. And this was burden on my heart just simply because of the world we live in. If we're not careful, we could be asleep to what God is trying to do. And if we're not careful, we can become actually more like this world and not like Christ. And so I'm, I'm really speaking even to the young generation too uh, today, just something just during the worship set. I just want you guys to know that young generation, you are being attacked so hard to be conformed into this world. And that does not go for the, does not exclude the, the older generations. We all, we may not realize it, and I'm hoping today's message actually helps awake us to the reality, but we all could be getting kind of really consumed and enticed and distracted by the things of this world. Why? Why is that, why is that there? Why is that a potential? Because we live in this world. But God is calling us to not, to not only just live in this world, but don't be like the world. So we have to live in this world, but don't be of the world. And so today, if God decides to convict you, can you let him do it? Because he's convicted me. If he, if he decides to encourage you, if he decides to show you something, let his spirit work because he's trying to keep us awake so we don't fall for the delusion of Satan in this world. And I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to say, I'm speaking like from the Matrix movie where if you eat this pill, you know, swallow this pill, you'll see things differently. I mean, but the reality is that's kind of the reality here is that Satan can blind us from the truth of what's actually going on. And we want to be aware and alert. So I want to go to our first reference of scripture for that. And that's Romans, Romans chapter 13. This, this scripture really spoke to me in study and preparation for this. And I just want to read it to you. Romans chapter 13, verse 11, Paul is talking to the church as usual here. He's writing to them. And the time is, it's always any time that Jesus, when Jesus like ascended into heaven, just so you know, when Jesus went up to heaven and the disciples were watching him go up to heaven, 
from that point on, it was the last days. It's been the last days since Jesus ascended into heaven. Do we know when exactly he's going to return? We don't. Should we be ready? Absolutely. We need to be ready and we need to be awake of when that's going to come. And so this is Paul. Paul is saying this with this tone in verse 11, Romans 13, verse 11. This is all the more urgent for you know how late it is. Time is running out. So he's saying this how many years ago, right? Around 1900, 200 or 2000 years ago. And he's saying this, time is running out. Wake up for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. And what he, mean by, what he means by salvation is the second coming of Christ to bring us with him. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove, look at, look at the imperative action he asks us to do. Not sleep and not care, but to be actively doing something. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Uh, just, I just thought of something when I was in Dominican Republic. We were cleaning, uh, we were cleaning up a giant uh, pit of junk at this orphanage. And uh, I had my burning shirt on, the youth group shirt. And um, well, we were pretty much picking up stuff where a tarantula nest was. Um, there was a lot, there was a lot of tarantulas. They were like this big. I was holding stuff like this. And later on we found tarantulas everywhere underneath this stuff. And so I, I, uh, I threw away that shirt. I didn't know if there's gonna be like a tarantula egg in it. I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to put it in my, my luggage, you know. I didn't want to be that guy that brings something nasty home. So I just threw that. Th I mean, I didn't even care. I was like, sorry, but yeah, yeah. I wanted to burn that thing. True story, we're carrying a log from like, we carried a log like 200 yards. It was this big log. I don't, we, we grabbed a ladder. We had to use our, you know, just our creativity. We grabbed a ladder, put the, the log on the ladder and we carried it like a stretcher. In order to get that log off the ladder, I had to pick up this log. We put it down, and what crawls out? A huge tarantula crawls out. I was like, I was just holding that. Ah. So that's why I burned those clothes pretty much. I threw them away, right? So maybe that helps you understand the scripture a little bit better. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the day, or in other words, Christ, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't let yourself think about, listen to this, this is not being... This is not being like tired. This is being awake. This is being alert, right? Don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Because those evil desires are there. They're in us. James talks about that. It comes from within. And he's saying, don't let yourself think of ways to indulge those evil desires, to entertain them and give in to them. So Paul is telling the church, Get rid of this old way and put on Jesus Christ. Now, we can't do that haphazardly just going through the week, right? We have to be awake and in touch with God. Next week is going to be really important that you're here because I'm going to talk about being equipped as a church, being ready with the word of God in our lives. So we live in a world where people don't even realize how far they're gone. And so even people that just entertain and indulge their evil desires. And Paul's like, don't be like them. Why? Because they need our help. They need us to shine in the darkness. Uh, I recently went, to, I recently went to, to New York City and I was there in Times Square and I couldn't believe what I was seeing with my eyes. Church, I couldn't believe it. And you might be like, well, you live in a bubble, Ryan. I've been there a lot, you know. I see it all the time. Well, I, I try to at least, right, guard my heart, guard my eyes from the things of this world, right? But as pastor said, this world is more visible than God, it seems, right? And so we have to make God visible to this world. Pastor said that last week, really stuck out to me. Well, when I was in Times Square, 
God broke my heart because what I saw is this might sound like, it might not sound like a big deal to, to us today, but it is a big deal to God. I saw idolizing consumerism, idolizing things. Like I saw people just looking for things to buy and carrying bags. And I was like, why am I noticing that? You know, what's the big deal? People can shop. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with shopping. I went shopping this past week. But the thing is, is like, what I felt God was trying to show me is, is that the world is trying to find satisfaction in these things. And they're going from store to store, hoping that they'll find joy and fulfillment. And in reality is they're just actually losing a bunch of money and they're never happy. And what they're really looking for, what they're really shopping for is fulfillment in Jesus Christ. What they're looking for is something beyond this world who is Jesus, who would bring peace and joy to their lives. Nothing that um, shopping therapy can do, even though sometimes that's fun to do, right? So then the second thing that happened when we were there is there was a demonstration, a nudity demonstration. And I'm thinking, wow, this is crazy. Like there was a demonstration and everyone's getting naked there in Times Square and people were surrounding them watching this. And what really broke my heart isn't just that adults were doing this, but young girls had their phones out looking at this display and we were all turned and looking the other way because we didn't want to see it. And that is the reality of our world right now in the middle and the heart of New York City, Times Square. That needs to bother us, you know? But it's not just what we see in public, it's what and who we are in private. And I'm asking today that we let the Holy Spirit awake us to see things that we need to see that maybe we have justified and okayed in our lives and we shouldn't because our light is gonna shine for the dark and for those who are lost in that. And it breaks my heart that that's even allowed, it's wrong, it's sinful, and it was a telling sign of our world that we live in today. It's a telling sign. So Paul gives us three ways that we can stay spiritually awake. I'm deriving three ways. I noticed three major topics from Ephesians 5. So let's go to Ephesians 5, verse 1. I, I want you guys to be aware of this. Um, there's different meanings for the word world in the Bible. There's the world as in God's creation. There's the world when it comes to the people. And then there's the world when it comes to the evil, okay, and the Greek. There's three different ways you can interpret that. When God said, God so loved the world, when the word says God so loved the world, he meant the people that he could reach, the people that need him. It's every mankind, all the world. He loves people. It doesn't mean he loves the evil in them or the evil that they're doing, okay? I'm not anti-people when I say stay away from the world. I'm talking about the evil influence of our world when I refer to that. So I don't want to sound like I'm a hater of all people. It's not like that. I, I'm in line with God. I'm in line with scripture when I say that this, this world is beautiful, the way that it's been created. People should be loved, but sin should be separated from that. And that's what, that's what Christ was talking about in John three sixteen. So Ephesians 5, I'm going to read through this and just teach as I go. Sound good? Verse five, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. The first way I see that Paul is saying that we can be awake spiritually is we need to be genuine and true to who we really are. We need to know our identity is in God, that we are children of God, that we are the light of the world. And I love how he starts off this scripture, imitate God. Let me ask you a question, asking myself the same question, who are we imitating? I want you to think about that for a second. When we go shopping, when we go about planning, when we go about living, when we go about comparing with our neighbors and the keeping up with the Joneses, right? 
when we go with our, our friends and our bosses or our, our people that are getting raises or people that are getting promoted and elevated, who are we imitating and is it God? And this hit me like a ton of bricks when I started reading this because the first thing we should do is, is know that our identity is in Christ and that we are children of God. And so who we imitate is not this world and the culture of this world, who we imitate is God. In other words, Jesus' culture should be our focus. That's who we compare ourselves to and that's who we follow. And it's so important because right now there is an attack on people's identity in our world. You know what I'm saying, don't you? People are confused of who they are. And so in the church, we cannot be confused of who we are. People are looking for, yeah. Praise God. People are looking for clarity. They're looking for answers. We have to know who we are and live it. And that's what Paul's saying here. And the best way you can live it is by following God. And I love how he brings it into perspective. He uses Jesus. He says, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. I love that. Let's go on to Ephesians 4, and I'm going to connect that right away, because the second thing I see Paul talking about is not just being genuine and true to your identity so that you don't fall for the world's identity, but you keep in line with God. But the second thing he says is be holy, and the word holy means to be set apart, different from the world. And so Paul gets into this deeply, and he really doesn't pull any punches he says, verse three, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's, what? People or children. So again, our identity determines our conduct. Get that. Our identity determines our conduct. I am a disciple of Christ. I am a follower of Jesus. Therefore, I'll use the word Christian. I am a Christian, which actually means the word Christ-like. So we should live like Christ. That should be our conduct in this world. And if we do keep that conduct, we will stay awake in this world and we will stay aware and alert of how we should be living. If we stay aware of Christ-like character, doesn't that make us able to stay aware of worldly character? So he says, be holy. Okay, by the way, Jesus died so we could be holy. Jesus died to get rid of the sin in our lives. So why would we jump back into what he died for, right? So he's trying to, he's telling the church, be holy. And, and he goes on to say this, obscene stories or foolish talk and coarse jokes. And when I looked that up in the Greek, it actually has to do with like sexual things too. He said, these are not for you. Instead, let there be, so in other words, perverted talk. Uh, let there be thankfulness to God. So he contrasts right away that here's how we should be talking. You can be sure that no immoral or impure or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. Why? For a greedy person is an idolater worship, worshiping the things of this, word, of this world. So listen, one, what's one of the commandments of the Bible? Have no other gods before me and make no other idols, right? So if we worship something in this world and we give it all of our attention and all of our heart and we raise it above God, we become an idolater of this world. You know, some of us, we love this world so much, we don't even necessarily want Jesus to come back. Right? I mean, have you ever felt that way? Like, oh, I can't wait to do this. And Pastor was touching on this last week. I can't wait to do this. I can't wait to have that. I can't wait. This is my dream. This is my dream. And I'm going to get to that. And I'm not trying to bash dreams. I mean, I love what Lexi said. She wanted to do God's will for her life. So she went to University of Valley Forge. Why? Because God's got a plan to use her in this world to bring people to heaven. That's the right focus, right? Even if you want to be an architect, can you use your skills to glorify God or the finances that you earn 
from that great job? Yes, you, whatever. You can do it to even help nonprofits, Christian nonprofits, like whoever built this church. Thank you. Thank you, God, for architects and engineers, right? So there's nothing wrong with that. But what Paul is saying is you're redeemed. So redeem the things of this world to be used for good. Use your college life. Use your dreams to reach the world for Christ. But he's saying here, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. I don't, I don't ever want to be called out by God that I worship this world. Ever. And listen to this, verse 6. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. How many of us have heard that recently? Justifying sin and, and being okay with sin and excusing it. No, we need to actually raise our standard and go, that's an excuse. I need to be holy. Number se or verse seven, don't participate in the things these people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live, this again is your identity. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. I love that. So it's Jesus in you that produces what is good, right, and true. So in this world, in this dark world, we can still be right, good, and true. That's awesome. And I see that all the time. I see the people of God contrasting the darkness with their good deeds and their light. And it's so encouraging. Verse 10, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret, but their evil intention will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Listen, uh, there are times, there, there are times when I'm reading this Bible, and it becomes like a flashlight that shines right on my heart or my mind and goes, hello, what's that doing there? <laughs> Sometimes it's other people's examples. They're living for Christ. Their faith is awesome. And it's like, whoa, why, why am I doubting so much? Like, listen to that faith, you know? And by the way, when I met Christ, it was a beautiful exposure of the darkness, but it didn't last long because then I felt completely loved by Christ. In other words, when I first met Christ, I realized how far gone I was. And it hurt at first to know that I had been okay with these sins. But then when Christ showed me that I'm a new person in him, I was encouraged again to live a new life. So yes, reading the Bible or coming to know Christ for the first time or re being reminded of Jesus will convict you and it will sometimes sting because the truth hurts sometimes, right? But he exposes that because he loves us. And we bring truth in our sermons. We, we get honest and we bring the scriptures out because we love you. And I do this with my kids because I love them. And I do this with the world in a, in a, you know, a little bit more relational, not like I just met them and like, hey, you're going to hell, you know. Like the other guy I saw in New York City who that's all he kept saying was, you're going to hell if you do this and this and this. But there was no answer. There was no answer. There was no way out of hell. It was just you're going to hell. That's not what we should do as Christians. Jesus is the way. So let's share Jesus with the lost, right? So we do these things because of love. God exposes things in our lives because he loves us. And he can change us. So Paul is telling the church, be holy. And I love what he keeps on saying here. He says, uh, carefully determine. That's exactness and accuracy. Carefully know what pleases the Lord. So holiness is, is to be like God, which is perfect. Now, here's the deal. When we became a Christian, God wiped away 
the darkness in our lives, the sin. He forgave us for that. He pardoned it because of Christ on the cross. It's beautiful. So when God looks at you, he sees Jesus and he sees you as holy because Jesus took the place for your sin and has washed you and made you new. This is, this is scripture. This is Romans if you want to read it. Okay, you are justified as if you've never sinned. So in order to be holy, first of all, we must be saved by Jesus Christ. Now there's an ongoing holiness, which is called sanctification. So salvation is what happens when you believe in Jesus. Sanctification is when we apply ourselves to the word of God and to what the Holy Spirit is trying to do in us to purify us from this world, to set us apart even better. Everyone thinks always the negative stuff, like stop doing this and you'll stop doing, that's why, I don't know if you know, but maybe in your life, you notice yourself slowly not caring for the things of this world as you grew closer to God, right? Slowly you didn't talk the way you used to talk and behave the way you used to behave. That's the Holy Spirit working. That's called sanctification. But there's more to it. And we talked about this in the Grow Conference. Our videos are on YouTube except for one. We had a glitch. We're going to work on that. Okay, we're going to redo it. Pastor Joey's going to preach his message that wasn't able to, to get on there. But listen, when I talked about it in the Grow Conference, what I said was it's not just what we don't do. It's the behavior we put on. So we're not just getting rid of things. We're putting on the new nature of Jesus Christ. Now, we can't do this, again, by just haphazardly doing life. We have to be aware, alert, and awake to what God, what pleases God and what God wants us to do. So that, again, is why next week is so important because we need to use the word of God to teach us what to do. So to be holy is really up to God. God, when we come to Christ, God makes us holy. And so now we continue that relationship and listen to 1 Peter 1. 13 through 16, it's on the screen as well. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. That doesn't sound like we're kind of just chilling, right? So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into, our, into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. Wow, that is a high standard of holiness, isn't it? That's why it takes a lifelong journey. And that's why if I'm going to be holy like God, I got to apply myself to that journey and repent of the things that are wrong in my life and accept the things that are right from Christ and what he wants me to do. So we learned that we need to be true to our identity and who we are. We need to be genuine. And we've learned that to be awake, we should be holy. Think about that for a second. If we are concentrating on living the Christ-like life and being holy, doesn't that mean that we're not so busy trying to be like this world? So lastly, he says, be wise. Ephesians 15 through 18. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Let me stop there for a moment. I've been reading through Proverbs I need wisdom, okay? I don't have it all together. And Proverbs is, is an incredible book for wisdom. And what I've found in the past couple of weeks is this verse, Proverbs 27, 22. You cannot separate fools from their foolishness, even though you grind them like grain with mortar and pestle. What does that mean? It means that when fools really get stuck in their foolish ways, it is hard to get out. And they can go through trial, they can go through testing and grinding, and they can go through every, th every single bad thing that could happen to them. I mean, God can allow them to go through all that mess and they still don't learn from their ways. Paul's like, don't be like that. Stay sensitive to what God wants you to do. The cross reference to that is Proverbs 26, 11. My son and I were reading this this past week and when he, you should have seen his face because this is what it says. 
as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his foolishness. My son was like, they do that? Yeah. I didn't know. I was like, unfortunately they do, and it's disgusting. It's disgusting. God bless them. But I got to talk to him about what does it mean to be a fool? What does it mean to be wise? And, and no one would go back to their vomit and eat it, right? But for some reason, we uh, in our world can be like fools where we constantly return back to that same thing that's messing us up, the destruction in our lives. And, and this is uh, another one. Proverbs really talks a lot about fools reject correction and discipline. Do you know why fools stay in that, that rut of constant foolishness? Because they reject correction and discipline. God has corrected us and disciplined us so that we will be wise and have a prosperous life and to be able to change the world. How does someone get out of that rut? How does someone get out of that foolishness? Only by the grace of God can they get out of that. And so they have to humble themselves repent of their sin and receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And what's interesting about this is uh, Paul is pretty much saying, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. So you know what we need to be careful of? Who we surround ourselves with. People influence us and either they're fools or they're wise people. And again, imitation is coming up in this verse. Don't imitate fools, imitate the wise. In the Bible, the wise are those who are righteous. So those who live a righteous, Christ-like life are considered wise. Imitate them. Paul said that. Imitate me or follow me as I follow Christ. Paul said that to the church. Proverbs 13, 20 says, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. Can I give you guys a little confession about me and my foolish day one day? Speaking of Valley Forge, I had a little mischievous season in my life. <laughs> uh, my roommate was sleeping. Here's someone that wasn't ready and he was still asleep, okay? <laughs> my roommate was sleeping and uh, he didn't have a shirt on, okay? He has a blanket over his waist and uh, it had snowed that day. <clears throat> And uh, we had like a saucer for going sledding, you know, it's like actually about this big, this table. And I just had this foolish slash bright idea to fill it up with snow and bring it back in and dump it on him while he slept. Just a little prank. And needless to say, when he uh, woke up, he was ready to punch me in the face. And uh, he was awake. He was ready. Um, I did some, some dumb things. I was foolish sometimes at college, but at least I wasn't jumping into the world, but just having fun with my Christian brothers. But just remind me of that because Valley Forge is here today as well. So he gives us three ways to be wise. I'm going to close with this. Three ways we can be wise. Now this, man, we were really unpacking a lot of scripture today, weren't we? So I know there's a lot to study on your own if you want to read through this again. I've left some things out because of time and it's just, you know, you can't do everything in one message but number one, one of the ways we're wise is we make the most of every opportunity. Paul is saying, make the most of every opportunity in verse 16, in these evil days. In other words, be a good steward of time and the opportunity that God's given you. You know what's really interesting is, is our, as our world has gotten darker, we get brighter as Christians if we're living holy and righteous. What do I mean by that? Have you ever been outside in a lit area and you couldn't see any stars, but as soon as you went out to a rural area or in the woods or sticks, maybe your home, you look up and you can see every constellation. There's a scripture for that. Philippians 2, 14 through 16. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. I don't like that verse, by the way. <laughs> Why? So that you may become blameless and pure. Wow, even that matters. The holiness of not grumbling or complaining or arguing matters to God. Why? So we can be blameless and pure. 
That might convict us a little bit of us at work, right? Because we want to be a light to our bosses, our coworkers. Children of God, so he's saying be blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Wow. So as we live holy, we shine in this dark world and we become examples of Christ in contrast to the way the world lives. So take every opportunity, even at times where you want to grumble and complain or argue. That is a hard one to apply. And I'm gonna need some help with that. The Holy Spirit will help you do that. He will, he will waken you up and he will go, hey, what are you doing right now? What are you doing? This is not a good example of Jesus Christ. Number two, Paul goes on to say, understand what the Lord wants us to do or carefully determine what pleases the Lord, as he said before. Here's a question. Again, I love how Lexi shared, God gets a say in her dreams. Does God get a say in our dreams and aspirations? What does God want you to do today, tomorrow, and next week? Does our agenda and plans take priority over God's? Does what God wants you to do, like go and make disciples, ever come to mind? I'm preaching to myself. Or is our plans for this and that just continue to be what we give all our attention to? Think about that. What is it that God wants you to do this week? What is God wanting you to do at your job, with your friends, in the community? I know one thing, we have a great opportunity to seize this week for Hope Day. Show your kids, show yourself what it's like to serve the less fortunate in our society. They need hope. This is gonna be a great opportunity this Saturday. What does God want us to do with our lives? It's something to think about, isn't it? By the way, next week we talk about the word of God which is God's revealed will. If you, if you are trying to figure out what is God, what's my purpose here? What, what am I doing here? Where am I going? You know, that's the Bible. The Bible gives us that. And so God's re revealed will to us is in the word of God. We're gonna talk about that next week. And lastly, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is what he says. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The result of that is you'll be singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You'll be making new songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love this. Instead of filling our lives with the things of this world, he's saying fill our lives with the Holy Spirit. More of Jesus so this week, my goal isn't to fill my life with more stuff and more things of this world. My goal is to be filled with the Holy Spirit through his word, through relationship with Jesus, through his spirit. And watch how your life changes. It's gonna be awesome. Watch what comes out of you, a different perspective on life. Do we want anxiety to disappear? Do we want negativity to go? Do we want depression to go? None of that is in Jesus Christ. None of that is in the Holy Spirit. He's peace, he's love, he's joy. So if we're feeling those things, I wanna encourage you, my friend and my fellow church, get with God and let him fill you. Worship this week, throw on worship on YouTube in your house and worship instead of all the other garbage that might be on, on TVs. And sometimes it's not even garbage, it's just empty. Some shows just don't bring any value to our lives, do they? It's just a time waster, not being a good steward of the opportunity in this evil days that we live in, as Paul says. Wow. Amen. I mean, I know that sounds radical, but it's only radical to us because of how far we've gone. For Paul in his days, they didn't have so many distractions. They didn't have all the technology and all the things that they could get busy with. They had community, they had their jobs, 
they had Jesus, they had worship, they had all these things. And so I know that's gonna be hard to translate into our society, but it's worth the fight. It's worth it. Because out of that, we're gonna be filled with more of God and less of this world, amen? So we wanna be a church that's ready. And a ready church doesn't live thoughtlessly and unconsciously in this world. Instead, we are awake and understand God's will for us in this, will, in this world. We want to know God's will for us in this world. That is an awesome experience to be hanging out with God and then light bulbs go off when you're reading the Bible or praying or worshiping and God's like, I got a plan for you today to love your neighbor or to be kind to your spouse or to give more attention to your kid. By the way, I mean, this family series was so important, right? Our kids are our first ministry, you know? This next generation coming up is a ministry for us. They're gonna be here when we're gone. It's so important we lead the way in this way and be wise with our time. I love how Paul just contrasted the entire time. Here's what the world does, but here's what we do. So digest the scripture this week. Let it feed you. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you for your word. Lord, I pray right now where we are that we would align ourselves to your word today. Speak to our hearts, God. Show us if we've been far from you. God, may we confess that, repent it, and be close to you today. God, teach us to be wise with our lives and our time. Teach us with your word and how we should live. Thank you, God, that we even have life. And may we use it to glorify you and to help those who don't know you come to you and believe in Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for this course correction today. ourselves to what you're doing. We stay in tune with what you want us to do, not what this world says to do. We're not going to be call our robots of this culture. We're not going to be led by this culture. We're going to be led by Christ, and we're going to shift and change culture. We're going to impact culture because we're the church of Jesus Christ. And God, you change the world through one man and a few of your people. And God, we want to be those people. today who we are